Hi, this is Stu Schwartz from MasterMathMentor.com. This is video AB30. The topic is the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, covering the AB Manual, pages 182 to 183. So far in calculus, we have learned four major concepts. Limits, derivatives, indefinite integrals, and definite integrals. We have seen that a definite integral represents an area under the curve. The question is, what do definite integrals have to do with derivatives? The answer is that the fundamental theorem of calculus, sometimes abbreviated FTC, is a theorem that links the concept of the derivative of a function with the concept of the function's indefinite integral. And it also states that the definite integral of a function can be computed using any of its infinitely many antiderivatives. The fundamental theorem of calculus states that if small f and capital F are continuous functions defined on a closed interval a to b, and if capital F prime of x equals small f of x, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of x evaluated from a to b, which is f of b minus f of a. Sounds complicated, but it really isn't, and we will show that in some examples. The FTC certainly has an important sounding name, and it is. It links the two halves of the course together and provides a relationship between the inverse processes of differentiation and integration and apply it to the area under a curve. Since it is so important, we will first show an informal proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus and then show how it is applied. We will now develop an informal proof that relates the concept of area under a curve and the indefinite integral process. So we start with a function f of x whose graph is shown in black. At any value x, capital F of x is the area, shown in orange, under small f between 0 and x. We start at x and move a slight distance h to the right to x plus h. We now focus on the blue, narrow, almost rectangular area between the value of x and x plus h, and that will be capital F of x plus h minus F capital F of x, as we're talking about the area. Now focus on the blue narrow rectangular area between the values x and x plus h below the word excess. The area of that rectangle is exactly h times f of x. So capital F of x plus h minus capital F of x is approximately equal to h times f of x. So our approximation becomes exact by adding on the, the excess, which is the slightly triangular area in, in darker blue. So capital F of x plus h minus capital F of x is equal to h times f of x plus the excess. We now rearrange and divide. So small f of x is equal to capital f of x plus h minus capital f of x all over h minus the excess over h. Next, focus on the small blue rectangle above and below the curve. That rectangle has area y times h. Next, look at the expression y times h over h. We know that's equal to y. So the limit as h approaches 0 of y times h over h has to equal y, 
and we know that that is zero as well. So as h gets close to zero, y gets close to zero. Since that little triangular area excess has to be less than y times h, then excess over h must be less than y times h over h, and therefore the limit as h approaches zero of excess over h is equal to zero as well. So that allows us to say that f of x is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of capital F of x plus h minus capital F of x over h, but we know that to be f prime of x. So if we integrate both sides, we get the integral of capital F prime of x dx is equal to the integral of little f of x dx, or capital F of x is equal to the integral of f of x dx. So what we're saying is that the area is found by an anti-differentiation process. That is what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. We will show nine simple problems in applying the fundamental theorem of calculus. Future videos will tackle more complex ones. The first problem reads the integral from 1 to 2 of x squared dx. We integrate and get x cubed over 3 and use this notation to say we want to look at that expression from a lower limit of 1 to an upper limit of 2. We plug the upper limit in first and then subtract the lower limit and get 8 thirds minus 1 third and our answer is 7 thirds. Number 2 reads the integral from negative 1 to 3 of 3x squared minus 2x minus 1 dx. We integrate and get x cubed minus x squared minus x evaluated from negative 1 to 3 and we get 27 minus 9 minus 3 minus the quantity negative 1 minus 1 plus 3. Final answer, 16. 3 reads the integral from 0 to 9 of the square root of x dx. We write the square root of x as x to the 1 half and integrate and get 2 thirds x to the 3 halves evaluated from 0 to 9. And that becomes 2 thirds times 27 or 18. Number 4 reads the integral from 5 to 10 of 2 over 3x squared. We can write that ex expression as 2 thirds x to the negative 2, and when we integrate we get negative 2 over 3x evaluated from 5 to 10. So that gives negative 2 over 30 plus 2 over 15. Final answer is 1 over 15. Number 5 reads the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 2x minus 1 quantity squared dx. We could do this with u substitution, but we will leave that till later. We expand the expression getting 4x squared minus 4x plus 1, and when we integrate, we get 4x to the third over 3 minus 2x squared plus x evaluated from negative 1 to 1. Doing the arithmetic, we get 4 thirds minus 2 plus 1 minus the quantity, negative 4 thirds minus 2 minus 1. And that gives 8 thirds plus 2. Final answer is 14 thirds. Number 6 reads the integral from 1 to 8 of x minus 2 over the cube root of x. We split this into two fractions and integrate each piece and get 3 fifths x to the 5 thirds minus 3 x to the 2 thirds evaluated from 1 to 8. So we end up with 96 fifths minus 3 times 4 minus quantity 3 fifths minus 3. Final answer is 48 fifths. 7 reads the integral from 0 to pi of 2 plus sine x. Integrating, integrating each piece, we get 2x minus cosine x evaluated from 0 to pi, and that becomes 2 pi plus 1 minus the quantity 0 minus 1. Final answer, 2 pi plus 2. 
Number 8 reads the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of 4x plus secant squared of x dx. Integrating each piece, we get 2x squared plus tangent of x evaluated from 0 to pi over 4. And that gives 2 pi squared over 16 plus the tangent of pi over 4, which is 1, minus the quantity 0 plus 0, getting pi squared over 8 plus 1. Number 9 is not quite as straightforward. We want the integral from 0 to 5 of the absolute value of 4 minus 2x dx. You have to realize that the absolute value of 4 minus 2x is not a single expression, but is comprised of a piecewise function. So we have to write it as two separate pieces. 4 minus 2x is 4 minus 2x if 4 minus 2x is greater than or equal to 0, or x is less than or equal to 2. 4 minus 2x is 2x minus 4 if 4 minus 2x is less than 0, or x is greater than 2. We graph the expression, and we see that there are two pieces. That means that we're going to need two definite integrals when we set up the calculation. So we want the integral from 0 to 2 of 4 minus 2x dx plus the integral from 2 to 5 of 2x minus 4 dx. The first integral is 4x minus x squared evaluated from 0 to 2. And the second integral is x squared minus 4x evaluated from 2 to 5. So for the first integral, we get 8 minus 4 minus 0. And the second integral, we get 25 minus 20 minus the quantity 4 minus 8. The total area is 13. Your TI-84 calculators are capable of approximating the values of definite integrals and can do it from the home screen or the graphing screen where you can actually see the area under the curve. It is usually the best to put the function in y1 or one of the y equal equations. Use math9, which is f-n-i-n-t, of y1 comma x comma lower limit comma upper limit. y1 is found in the vars y vars menu. So to find the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared minus 1 dx, we place the function into y1 and then ask for finint y1 comma x comma 0 comma 2, and we get 0.667. You can then change your answer to a fraction for relatively easy functions. And this will change it to 2 thirds. If you want to actually see the area, create a window that shows the function within the limits given, and then press second calc, integral of f of x dx. You are asked to input the lower limit and the upper limit. Notice in this case, we see our area sum below the axis, sum above the axis, and that is why our answer is close to zero. Understand that the calculator is not actually applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, and its answers will not always be perfectly exact. Like finding the numerical derivative on the calculator, the calculator approximates the definite integral. It will use a method to, but superior to, Riemann sums. But it is not an, an exact method. For instance, we know that the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of x dx is equal to 0. But according to the calculator, we get an answer which is not quite 0. It is slightly negative. That's because the calculator is not actually integrating, but approximating. When you see an answer that goes into scientific notation with an exponent that is very negative, it is the calculator's way of telling you that the answer is essentially equal to zero. It is recommended that on the sample problems we just did and all homework problems, you use the calculation as a verification tool.
In our next video, AB31, concerning definite integrals with u substitution, we will show that the difficult integral 0 to pi over 2 sine x square root of cosine x dx can be simplified into the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the 1 half du. That is coming up on the next video.